com vocês, Tomás Milani. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee and in particular Paula, Rogério, Glenda, Branca and of course Rodrigo who has introduced me for inviting me to deliver a plenary address here at the 18th World Congress of Applied Linguistics in Rio de Janeiro. I'm really honored to be here. Obrigado. I'm also particularly grateful to the translators Rodrigo Borba and Clarissa Gonzalez for translating my slides from English to Portuguese and Spanish. And I'm grateful to the audience in the room who after two intense days of presentations and yesterday's Dutch night still has chosen to come to this presentation instead of enjoying the pleasures of the sun in the nearby beach. By the way, Groningen might have bigger beaches, but I'm sure it's going to be much colder than here, so enjoy the walk. Before I begin my plenary, I want to pay respect to the Brazilian indigenous population and the millions of enslaved black people that were forcibly removed from their ancestral lands, killed and exploited by people with a body like mine for the creation of modern Brazil. The beauty of this place is haunted by the trauma of people of color who have, expe who have, who have um, experienced this trauma by the hand of white colonizers. In my talk, I want to take the opportunity to engage with some aspects of the theme of this Congress, innovation and epistemological challenges in applied linguistics. As you will see, I draw and expand on some of the points made by Luis Paulo da Morta Lopez in the opening plenary, as well as echo some of the arguments advanced by Mary Buckles yesterday in the context of the US. I make no claim about innovative approaches. I'm not here to propose a new method or a new theory. After all, as Michel Foucault would point out, we should be very suspicious about any claim to novelty and progress, as such statements are discursive moves through which knowledge intersects with power. Rather, I take as my starting point the geopolitical location of this conference in order to harness existing research and data from the Global South, which brings some challenges, epistemological and otherwise, to the field of applied linguistics. And some of the arguments in this talk were developed in conversation with my colleague Michelle Lazar at National University of Singapore and published in the latest special issue of the Journal of Sociolinguistics. The presentation is structured as follows. I begin by spending some time locating the debate around Southern perspectives in relation to existing academic discussions both inside and outside applied linguistics. I then move on to an example of undisciplined meaning-making practice in the context of the recent South African student protest for free, quality, decolonized education. I offer a few self-reflexive remarks about my own positionality as a privileged, white, middle-class, able-bodied, queer academic born and raised in the North, who has recently moved back to the far North, to Sweden, after eight years of living and researching in South Africa, where I retain some affiliation. I conclude with a few observations about the implications of the data I present here for applied linguistics. But let's begin with the theoretical framing. With this talk, I want to enter into an ongoing dialogue that was crystallized in a special issue of the prestigious journal Applied Linguistics in 2015, edited by John Kellerman and Anna Maurana. Organized under the title Definitions for Applied Linguistics, seven distinguished scholars in the field, six at prestigious northern universities, and one in Australia, offer thought-provoking position papers about, and here I quote from some titles, the past and future, the death and life of applied linguistics, as well as interesting reflections on theoretical and methodological developments of the field. However, as Anna Maurenen cautions in the summary that closes the special issue, of course, the contributors each looked at the origins of the field, and I would add the challenges and research priorities of the field from their own perspectives, American, British, or Australian, with some continental European overtones, which is bound to invite divergences. Indeed, if entertained from the vantage point of, say, Brazil, India, or South Africa, such a project might result in even more radical divergences. And it is precisely a, another vantage point that I want to bring to these discussions. 
I do so by expanding on Tim McNamara's observation that applied linguistics is facing a renewed challenge from theory. This is because the field is increasingly aware of and influenced by new sources of theory, drawing on discussions of language outside the social sciences. And McNamara goes on to conclude that to fully appreciate the challenge represented by post-structuralism would be a revolutionary change for applied linguistics. This seems to me, or to him, the most important challenge currently facing us. Having applied post-structuralist thoughts throughout my research career, I can attest to the importance of this epistemology for applied linguistics. However, as someone who has lived in a context like South Africa for the last eight years, I want to add a southern perspective, a way of seeing, as James Scott famously put it, to the post-structuralist challenge of theory. What do I mean by South and by Southern? From a, long, from a world scale perspective, the expression Global South as opposed to the Global North is useful to encapsulate the nexus of geographical positionality and histories of political marginality, as well as capture the complexity of contemporary post-colonial conditions. I know that there are many of you in the audience who disagree in this, but about this binaristic way of thinking, and we can discuss it during the, the break. And in, any engagement with the South, however, has not just to do with positioning the spotlight on a specific set of geographical, historical, and political conditions. It is also a way of bringing applied linguistic scholarship into dialogue with current discussions around a set of concepts and approaches that have variously been labeled Southern theories, theories from the South, or Southern epistemologies. And I'm in no way saying that these discussions aren't new, but they are nonetheless happening now in the social sciences and are connected with the work of anthropologists, political scientists, sociologists, and philosophers, such as Buaventura de Sosa Santos, Maria Lugones, Nelson Maldonado Torres, Anibal Quijano, Walter Mignolo, to name just a few. There's also an active group of Southern scholars of language in social context, whether they identify themselves as sociolinguists or applied linguists, which include Christopher Stroud, Quentin Williams, Amina Peck, Anna Doimert, Kathleen Hugh, Carolyn Kerfoot, Ruspalo de Moita Lopez, Rodrigo Borba, Branco Falabella Fabrizio, and many, many others who, among other present, presenting powerful papers in the workshop yesterday on Southern linguistics. These researchers have been inspiring me in shaping the arguments of this talk, and you will hear their voices, well, at least metaphorically, in a Bakhtinian way, in textualizing in, in this presentation. But the, all the remaining errors are, of course, my own. Before going further, I need to state that I'm not advocating that on the basis of the historical, economic, or sociopolitical specificities of Southern condition, we should develop a conceptual and analytical apparatus that is incommensurably different and separate from Northern theorizing, although I'm very sympathetic to scholars who believe that, but that's not the position I'm taking here. Rather, I subscribe to a position that is premised on the inevitability of the transnational circulation of theoretical ideas, and it employs linkages strategically envisioning possible cross-fertilization. While time constraints do not allow me to offer a comprehensive overview of what different Southern theories, approaches, and epistemologies bring with them, suffices to say that for me, a Southern perspective is primarily a heuristic vantage point from which to speak back to the North and Northern scholarship. In this talk, I will focus specifically on speaking back in a manner that historicizes, in other words, constantly reminds ourselves of the coloniality of power knowledge. Nelson Maldonado Torres explains that coloniality refers to long-standing patterns of power that emerge as a result of colonialism, but that define cultural labor, intersubjectivity relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administrations. Thus, coloniality survives colonialism. More specifically, I will show in this presentation that coloniality ultimately produces specific regimes of intelligibility that regulate which meaning-making practices of claim-staking are praised and rat ratified as legitimate, while others are made unintelligible, ridiculed, or dismissed as illegal. 
By taking such a southern approach, I hope partly to address Claire Cromsch's appeal to applied linguists that the greatest challenge would be for applied linguistic theory to theorize the practice in such a way as to do justice both to the heteroglossic and political diversity of the practice and its own epistemological multiculturality and to accept to be changed in the process. This should be done with cognizance that applied linguistics remain faithful to its empirical mandate to identify, analyze, and possibly solve practical problems of language and communication. And if you go to the ILA website, you will see that the issue of solving problems of language and communication is a key component of how applied linguistics is defined, at least officially, by its world organization. It is an example of the practical problems of language and communication that I want to examine in my talk. Under the label language and communication, I do not merely refer to verbal or, and written codes or registers and styles, but similar to what we heard in Lorenza Mondada's plenary, to a broader variety of meaning-making resources that include the body and its interfaces with the materiality of the built environment. More specifically, I investigate a specific moment in the recent in recent South African history, the student protests that shook my university and indeed the country in 2015 and 2016 by looking at practices, in other words, what students did and how their embodied performances were received on a variety of media platforms. From this vantage point, I will illustrate the coloniality of power knowledge that regulates the intersectional nexus points of gender and race and creates specific regimes of intelligibility and unintelligibility that praise or dismiss very similar embodied speech acts. The example I will show you in a moment are part of an eclectic archive that includes university management, email communication with staff during the student protests, news reports and op-ed pieces about the protests in mainstream South African media, tweets and Facebook posts commenting on mainstream reporting about the protests, and most importantly, my own lived experience as a privileged member of staff whose own able-bodiness, whiteness, and maleness allowed him, me, to navigate the campus in a relatively safe and sheltered way in a context of ongoing warfare. As Anna Doimert and Kululeko Mabandla note with regard to eclectic methodologies that draw upon, among other things, one's own observation and experiences, such an approach might appear anecdotal to the more empirically minded sociolinguist or applied linguist. <clears throat> Yet anecdotalism has a logic of its own and is important in achieving phenomenological understanding. Most of you were not there in South Africa during the protests, or more specifically in Johannesburg, <clears throat> on the campus of the University of the Witwatersrand where I worked. So I need to first locate the specific semiotic practice which I'm going to analyze within the broader context of the student protest and hopefully give a sense of the highly complex and emotional atmosphere on campus at the time. <coughs> Sorry. It's practically impossible to do justice to South African student protests over the last few years within the time frame of a talk. Moreover, retellings of historical events bear with them the risk of constructing a simplified linearity that inevitably downplays the complexity and multilayeredness of what actually happened. <coughs> South Africa has a long history of student protests. In the relatively recent past of state-sanctioned racial segregation and domination, apartheid, the Soweto uprising of 1976, where a reaction by both students and the broader public against the introduction of Afrikaans as compulsory medium of instruction in school for black people. The uprising <clears throat> have become and continue to be hailed as a historical milestone in black people's resistance to the white supremacist racial order. Forty years later, and now within a democratic system, students are still protesting, this time their goal is a more just higher educational system that, as the students put it, should be quality, free, and decolonized. Why these requests? Despite the fact that the majority of tertiary education institutions in South Africa are public, university fees remain very high. Admittedly, fees vary from university to university, but 
A year of undergraduate tuition at the University of Witwatersrand costs approximately 50,000 South African Rand, which responds to 3,700 US dollars, 3,200 euros, or 12,000 Brazilian riyadh, and is only slightly lower than the average annual income of a black family. In contrast, a white family earns on average six times more than a black household. Each year in September, October, the Department of Higher Education and Training sets the annual fee increment, which is typically higher than inflation. Students do have access to a Byzantine public financial aid system supplemented by corporate grants, but poor administration, unfair rules, and insufficient funding mean that many students are left out. Those that make it to the university find that the curriculum for many disciplines, including sociology, anthropology, and linguistics, is mainly based on literature produced in the northern western context using methods and yielding results that are perceived by many South African students as not only irrelevant but also hostile, even violent research to their own lived experiences. It is against this backdrop that students began to demand from university management and staff a more proactive approach to the colonial legacy of the university system. At the University of Cape Town, this legacy was most cogently embodied in the statue of the arch-imperialist and mining magnate, Cecil John Rhodes. At the Rhodes Must Fall protest in 2015, students demanded his statue to be removed from their campus. This call catalyzed the nationwide Fees Must Fall movement, as well as spawning a global campaign that soon spread to Oxford University and elsewhere. As a result of the 2015 protest, the Department um, of Higher Education and Training announced a 0% fee increase for 2016. And Cecil John Rhodes finally was removed from the steps of the University of Cape Town. Imagine that we are now in 2016. Inflation is 6.5%. University have not been able to raise fees, but the Department of Higher Education and Training has also not sufficiently increased funding to university in order to cover the shortfall. University administrators begin to fret over budgets. Students, on the other hand, are not satisfied with a free, sorry, with a fee freeze and want instead a long-term commitment to free education. What does the Department of Higher Education do? In September 2016, Higher Education Minister Bladen Zimande announced that the university are permitted, and you have to follow me here, permitted, allowed to implement a fee increase of up to a maximum of 8%. So he says that you can raise fees as much as you want, the top is 8%. Students immediately start protesting. Observe how in an email sent to staff and students of my university, let me see my email box, um, this senior executive team at the University of Witwatersrand re-intextualized the minister's statement as an authoritative statement of fact. According to them, the Minister of Higher Education, Dr. Blaise Demander, recommended an 8% increase in university fees. That's not what he said. He actually said it's up to 8%. But the university said, like, no, we go for 8%. You know. In the same email, which is very long, and I'm not going to read it to you, otherwise we'll spend here the next 45 minutes, we were also informed that, and I'm going to choose some passages, some students rejected the recommendation, decided to embark on protests. Campus control and private security tried to contain the protests, and public order police were called in to clear the entrances. Some students did at times get annoyed, but overall, most people behaved in a measured way. It is important to get the balance right in managing the protests. If we are too heavy handed, it could backfire, if we are too soft, and it could involve in the violation of rights of others. Our priority, it must be remembered, is to keep the academic pro program intact. The future of too many students and families depend on their performance in university. We should do all is possible to ensure the academic program. We have beefed up security. People who are interested in metaphors will have a ball here. And have finalized protocols with the police to ensure that safety and security is in place at vets. We have also come to an agreement with the student leadership. This entails the following. They will be allowed to use the concourse in Solomon McClangle House, and I'll come back to this, between 5 and 10 p.m. Please know that tomorrow is business as usual. 
we will have heightened security measures to ensure the safety and protection of all. There may be, as a result, minor inconveniences experienced. Well, you see the minor inconveniences. And we ask you to bear with us in this regard. Know, however, that we as a community can only grow stronger through the collective resolution of these challenges. Senior Executive Team, 19 September 2016. This email is not idiosyncratic but contains some key words which will be recurrent in the following weeks, communication with staff and students that indicate deeper ideological issues and ultimately resulted in practical problems, not just of language and communication, but also of personal safety and well-being. First, words such as minor inconveniences are manifestation of university management's mitigation strategies that tone down issues of bodily safety for everyone on campus and especially for female students and staff, who, as it will happen later, were harassed by male private security officers. This mitigating rhetoric was used to justify the directive to continue all teaching and learning activities with the exception of a few days when the university was closed down. You will see in the context, with the context I had to teach in. Collective resolution of struggle and similar expressions reflect management's commitment to the notion of an idealized rational public debate where both students and administrators have equal right to speak and a chance to be heard. But as Sarah Mills points out, not everyone is able to make statements or to have statements taken seriously by others, often because those statements have been uttered in what is dismissed as wrong, bad, inappropriate, or irrational spoken or written repertoire. And I will return later on in this talk to the unintelligibility of what is deemed emotional behavior because it is the crux in the practical problem of language and communication between university administration and students. And third, management's lack of understanding of the symbolic loading of specific university spaces and their rights to control these spaces. The central administrative building of the university, what used to be called Senate House, was officially renamed Solomon McClango House in tribute to the student activists executed by the apartheid government in the 1970s, but only after sustained pressure from students. In the email, management invoked its right to limit access to university spaces, but this act has in famous historical precedents and ideological associations with the infamous Trespass Act of 1959, which still has legal force in South Africa, and during apartheid was used to police and constrain black bodies' mobility through a variety of spaces. It is unclear whether student representatives actually agreed on the terms of admission to Solomon Makango House. Either way, the broader student collectives you know, was enraged by what they saw as an encroachment on their freedom to access a symbolic space for political action. This escalated the conflict. Students saw Solomon House as a home from which they were suddenly excluded and needed to reconquer by any means, including intifada-like stone throwing. Police and private security in riot gear responded with force using stun grenades, tear gas, and rubber bullets, as well in, in at least one case, throwing stones back at the students, who of course do not have a riot gear on them. The short video which I'm going to show you contains violent images. So if you feel uncomfortable or if you do not want to, I do not want to re-traumatize any South African in the audience, just don't look at it. Don't watch the video. But I want to give a good indication for those who were not there of the climate on campus between September and December 2016. It is in the context of this campus warfare that something remarkable happened. Three black female students, Sarah Mokwebo, Lerato Motown, Klingiven Lohu, created the moment of truce, albeit a brief one, by taking off their t-shirts and marching bare-chested towards the row of police vehicles with their hands crossed over their heads as if in chain. And they shouted, stop shooting at us. 
I have decided to focus on this specific event because it encapsulates the main problem of language and communication between university management and students, which ultimately prevented the collective resolution of the struggle that the university wanted to achieve. This event also allows me to address the issue of coloniality of knowledge I mentioned earlier in relation to Southern perspective to apply linguistics. However, I have deliberately chosen not to show you the videos of the naked protests, which are readily available on various social media sites, because I do not want to recreate here the possibility of setting up the, those very conditions of the colonial prurience which I'm about to criticize and which is based on an, an affective mixture of shock, titillation, and disgust. The videos of the bare-chested women immediately went viral on Twitter and Facebook and generated a flurry of reactions both in support of and against the three women's actions by a variety of commentators in and outside of South Africa. The supportive comments highlighted the bravery of the three women, their vulnerability and the potential harm they exposed themselves to, as well as comments about the attractiveness of their body parts, mainly breasts and buttocks. In contrast, the dismissive pronouncements against their bodily and linguistic practices can be divided into three main groups. Body shaming utterances that are supposed to be humorous and raise laughter by making fun of the aesthetic inappropriateness of the three students' bodies for public spectacle. According to this logic, women marching naked is only acceptable if their bodies conform to specific aesthetic ideas of slimness, fitness, as well as specific shapes of breasts and buttocks. The other group of comments were dehumanizing statements in which the three students are compared to a broad spectrum of animals. And then comments about the public indecencies of the actual act. I will consider each of these in turn, but for similar reasons to what I said earlier about my decision not to show the video of the protest, I will not present these body shaming jokes in order to avoid setting up the conditions for any form of laughter, even nervous one, among the audience here. I won't show you either the dehumanizing statements in order not to embellish them with an academic veneer and thus diminish the injurious loading of the discourse I'm criticizing. If you feel the need to see the data, you can Google naked protest bits and you will find a readily available rich digital archive. What is important to underscore for the purpose of this talk is that body shaming actions that play on the repugnance and inappropriateness of certain body shapes are the other side of the same coin. They're this other side of those remarks in support of the protesters praising the erotic appeal of those very bodies. Viewed from a feminist perspective, all these comments are manifestations of a problematic voyeuristic and fetishistic male gaze, as film theorist Laura Mulvey famously called it, which feels entitled to monitor women, reduce them to a bodily commodity, and remark upon them, saying publicly what is agreeable to a man's eye, and what thereby is approved and ratified in what is not. And let us remember ourselves that the male gaze is not a prerogative of male bodied individuals, and women too can assess themselves, have internalized the male gaze, and assess other female bodies in this way. What makes the body shaming comments significant, or better, particularly significant in the South African context, is not gender alone. It is the mutually constitutive nature of gender and race that emerges out of colonialism. From a historicizing perspective, the three students' bodies are just a small piece in a broader historical puzzle in which black female bodies have been the object of attention and inspection for centuries. The prurient comments in 2016 about the students' breasts and buttocks are nearly word-for-word -word repetitions of what British and other European scientists and commentators said about black female bodies in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. The best known case is perhaps that of Sarah Bartman, the Khoisan woman forcibly taken to Britain at the turn of the 19th century, where she was turned into an object of public curiosity. It is also not accidental that in the same way as Sarah Bartman's movements and bodily traits were compared to that of animals, the students were also described in animalistic ways, and their behavior deemed unacceptable because it was seen as irrationally non-human. 
Interestingly, the reason-emotion dichotomy was also used by the university management in order to legitimize its own allegedly rational handling of the protests while dismissing what my vice chancellor, Adam Habib, later called the politics of spectacle as an irrational act lacking political pragmatic judgment. But according to one of the three protesting women, Sarah Mokwebo, it is precisely in the emotional force produced by a naked black female body in a public space that lies the heart, the crux of the, claim, the act of claim staking, their affective agency, to use Sebastian Ferrada and Mary Buckles' term. As Sarah Mokwebo pointed out in an interview, emotionally we're drained. This emotional work is what people tend not to acknowledge or understand. Students don't just put their bodies in the firing, and one could say their naked body in the firing, because it's fun. Or we are trying not to write exams, or whatever the case people think may be. We are safer than we were yesterday, but we are still cautious about the presence of private security currently on campus, who also physically and sexually assault and harass students. To theorize from Sarah Mokwebo's statement and the actions of the three black women, one could propose that the naked protest was an example of what Chris Stroud calls linguistic semiotic citizenship. I find Stroud's notion particularly helpful to conceptualize what we heard yesterday in Mary Buckles' plenary about, and here a quote from her, social justice as the struggle for self-determination. Linguistic semiotic citizenship is what people do with and around languages and other multimodal means, including the body, in order to position themselves agentively and to craft new emergent subjectivities of political speakerhood, often outside of those prescribed or legitimated in institutional frameworks of the state or the university. And this, as Sarah Mokwebo highlights, involves the harnesses of specific structures of feelings, to borrow from sociologist Raymond Williams, which include the strategic invoking of the historical trauma of slavery, because they were marching with their hands tied, right? Uh, through the replete repetition of the performance of the naked, enchained black body. So what went wrong? Where lies the practical problem of language and communication in the three students in body speech act? Why was this in body speech act and similar ones in, uh, that actually relied on emotion dismissed by many, including university management, as the performance of a pack of irrational creatures? Bruno Latour, Felicity McGillchrist, and many, many other scholars from the South have convincingly argued that enlightenment, rationality, and universalism serve to legitimize colonizers as worthy winners who ought to take care of the material assets of irrational and therefore irresponsible colonized losers. So this is what enlightenment did to us. This was achieved in Terralia through the resignification of gender. As uh, the philosopher Xerxes Mendes provocatively proposes, viewed from a critical perspective on colonialism, gender cannot be reduced to a relation between an undifferentiated category of men and women because to reduce it, it in this fashion means to obscure the bodies and the history of the enslaved and the critical role they play in giving gender new meaning. Put differently, colonial rationality warped the mutually constitutive nexus of gender and race and made it the very condition of what counts as human or not, and thereby justified social relations in the colonies and the metropoles. Although colonialism is allegedly long gone, a colonial rationality inheres in the body shaming and animalistic commentaries on the naked protest in 2016. Furthermore, anthropologist Anne Stoller notes that colonial rationality was compounded by a concern about moral respectability. We're all, we're all inherited Victorians. Put simply, the enslaved black body needed controlling not only because it was viewed as irrational and less than human, but also because it was considered degenerate and lacking decorum. This is what also appeared in the reactions against the naked protest. A YouTube commentator said, how did these foolish women make it to varsity? They must get arrested for public indecency. What is this, umfana? 
which is a beach outside Durban. My goodness, where have you ever heard of free tertiary education? Reduction, yes, but free, come now. This was not an individual and random remark from some random person in South Africa, because the issue of indecent exposure was also raised by the then acting national police commissioner, Komotsu Paklane, in a press conference. His comments appeared on several online media sites and were retweeted uh, widely. South Africa Today writes, Acting National Police Commissioner, Lieutenant General Komotsu Baklane, argued that the police were lenient on the three female students who stripped topless bearing their breasts in a bid to reach ceasefire because they had engaged in public indecency. When those students took off their clothes, was that not public indecency? Well, you know, you're a police officer, you tell me, right? I'm going to ask you the question. Is public indecency not an offense? It is within our mandate. Where are their parents? We must call them to order, Paklana said. Paklana said he had visited various campuses in the province on Tuesday to see the aftermath for himself. He called on protesting students to refrain from attacking law enforcement officers while saying that his members would also exercise maximum restraint and engage in meaningful dialogue. A meaningful dialogue from the police, meaningless dialogue from the students. In South Africa, indecent exposure, exposure is covered, well, quite literally, by the Sexual Offences Act of 2007, revised in 2015. According to the Act, the intentional exposure of genitals, anus, difficult to do that, but done, and breasts in public, whether for sexual arousal or not, does indeed count as an offence on condition that a third party lodges a complaint. Research on the history of gender and sexuality have amply demonstrated that the erotic loading of specific anatomic parts and of other is neither genetic, it's not something we have, nor universal, but historically and socioculturally situated. If we are to believe novels like Pamela and Clarissa, there is nothing more erotic for a heterosexual British English squire than the female ankle, the sheer sight of which arises in him virile thoughts. On the other hand, women and men in many other cultures of the world lived and still live their public lives showing breasts, buttocks, and genitals. Moreover, as the Merriam-Webster definition indicates, the word breast does not only indicate mammary glands in female bodies, but more broadly, and here I quote from the Merriam-Webster, the fore or ventral part of the body between the neck and the abdomen. What I want to say is that men have breasts too, right? We do. Although in English-speaking context, this body part is, is typically called chest or pecs in daily parlance. Now let me show you what happened in Johannesburg when a white man took off his shirt and showed his breasts, well his chest or pecs, and started directing the traffic at the major intersection, and this major intersection is at 200 meters from where the students march naked, right, so not far away, during an electricity blackout. The man justified his action by saying, I had to take off my shirt to make sure I was visible and wouldn't get run over. But this is also what the three black women at Vitz had tried to achieve, right? To use nakedness to signify vulnerability in order not to get shot by the police, right? Well, you were not being run over and not get shot. You see, you see the similarities? Similar embodied speech acts with parallel intention, however, led to very different effects. My point is that this difference is incredibly significant and is not accidental. The three bare-chested black female students whose bodies did not fit in normative ideas of slimness were made fun of, viewed as irrational creatures, scornfully condemned as foolish women who should be arrested for public indecency, indecency and treated, even though they were all over 18, as naughty kids whose parents should call them to order. In contrast, the bare-chested white men whose body matches normative ideas of the tone and fit masculine physique was hailed in many local news reports, and here I quote, as a savior who uses six-pack powers for the good of fellow citizens. While the naked protest at Vitz was dismissed by many commentators as an indecent act of linguistic semiotic citizenship, 
the white man's exposure of his toned upper body was unanimously celebrated as a praiseworthy act of citizen engagement. And here, quote, a random act of kindness, as some media put it. In a context like South Africa, where despite economic development and growing black middle class, only 19% of black households own cars, compared to 91% of white households, one should ask whether the kind act of directing traffic really is that random after all. The difference in reception of the Twin Bodies Act does not, focus on not, lie in an alleged erotic differential between female breasts and male chest. Put simply, it is not that his chest is less erotic than their breasts. Observe how the erotic appeal of his chiseled upper body is overtly harnessed by the journalists in, the, in news reporting. The radio station, Yakaranda FM, prefaced the news report saying, ladies, be, not men, not, not gents, ladies, be prepared to pray to get stuck in the traffic because this gent is the beauty of nerve. Sigh, if only, on, if only all pointsmen could look like this. While the Rosebank and Kilani Gazette wrote, luckily for motorists and the ladies, as if like women are going drive cars anyway, 29 year old Jerry Band stepped up to assist with directing traffic at a busy intersection. This young man could definitely be South Africa's sexiest cop. Here the journalist swings at imagined audiences reproduce heteronormative assumptions about who is and should be allowed to enjoy a bare-chested male body. Men would do too. Most importantly, it is the very erotic appeal of this specific type of fit gender bodies, newsworthy and worth flirting about, that forms the basis of Jerry Band's supposed election as South Africa's sexist cop. Inspired by the work of the philosophers Maria Lugones and Xerxes Mendes, Monique Shakespeare and Chris Stroud noted an important dimension of enduring coloniality is the knowledge we have of our embodied gender, racialized and sexualized selves, and the praxis practice through which these selves can be inserted into the everyday. Concepts of gender and race that evolved out of imperial coloniality remain tightly imbricated in contemporary forms of coloniality modernity. It is this coloniality of knowledge that is working in determining the legibility of the body, dispensing differential treatment for similar embodied speech acts of nakedness. The affected and embodied messages of the naked protested bits became incomprehensible for some social actors, while the naked men became immediately recognizable and praised because of a colonial matrix that regiments public indecency and ultimately determines what counts as acceptable versus unacceptable bodily act. But who am I to say this? Joya Pon Homi Baba, Brazilian sociolinguist Lim Mario Menezes de Sousa, reminds us that all representations emerge out of specifically social, socially, ideologically, and historically located discursive loci of enunciation. In no way do I mean here to be claiming to speak on behalf of the three female black protesters. On the contrary, I read, I read these acts as a white male academic whose race and gendered body protected me during the protests and allowed me to navigate the university campus far more safely than black female students and academics. Even if I'm not speaking on behalf of the students, so I'm not speaking on behalf of the students, but even if I'm not speaking on behalf of the students, the very decision for a white male academic to focus on black female bodies as a topic of one's plenary speech is not seen as completely uncontroversial in South Africa by many sexual and gender activists and students and colleagues who bemoan that any scholarship in which oh, sorry, who bemoan any scholarship in which researchers are not themselves members of the groups they are studying. And I really respect the suspicion about me being here. Viewed from an intersectional perspective, our lived experiences are shaped very differently because of the dynamic interplay between, on the one hand, a plethora of mutually constituting macro factors like class, gender, race, sexuality, citizen, refugee staple, um, 
and a variety of individual specific micro circumstances. To a certain degree, there is something irreducibly unique in each individual's experience of the world. However, to say that one cannot, can only speak for oneself and about oneself is based here, and here a quote from Linda Alcoff, on the illusion that the self consists in a unified whole capable of autonomy from others. Whether speaking for oneself or with and about others, and here a quote again, we are collectively caught in an intricate, delicate web in which each action I take, discursive or otherwise, pulls on, breaks off, or maintains the tension in many strands of a web in which others find themselves moving also. So we have to remember this conundrum in mind. But for me, what the three black female students' body, so what the black female bodies did at Wits University is not so much an act to be analyzed, but that Luis Paulo in, said in his plenary is an example that illustrated how practice is the head of theory. This is an example of undisciplined practice of epistemic disobedience, as Mignola would call it, from which to learn, I have, I have a lot to learn, as the white, queer, middle-class, able-bodied, male applied linguist. So what are the implications for applied linguistics? And I'm getting to my end. Let's go back to how I began this talk. I said that I wanted to offer a southern perspective on current discussions about epistemological challenges to applied linguistics. I used an example of practical problems in language and communication spurred by clear prompt encouragement, and here I quote again, to theorize the practice in such a way to do justice both to the heteroglossic and political diversity of the practice and to accept to be changed in the process. First, the embodied acts I presented here might not be the kind of language and communication that most applied linguists would typically bring under the analytical spotlight. But instead of dismissing such embodied acts as this is not applied linguistics, I hope that applied linguists will take the opportunity to further expand the analytical remit of this broad field of inquiry towards Amina Peck and Chris Stroud have named Skinscapes and Alastair Pennycooks have recently called posthumanist applied linguistics. That is a focus on the materiality of the body and its complex interface with specs. Second, I hope it was clear that the example I showed you are not idiosyncratic and trivial, but capture what Ashil Mbembe calls the banality of power in the post-colony. These embodied speech acts may appear mundane, but they capture the dramatic entanglement between wider problems of subjection and its corollary in discipline. In order to understand this entanglement from a southern perspective, we need to repurpose post-structuralism and take into account the way in which coloniality structures how people think, feel, and act, reproducing and contesting the social order. This is not simply to say that we should consider race as an analytical construct, but also, and most importantly, we should account for its colonial pedigree, which imbricated race with other social categories in a mutually constitutive knot. And this applies not simply to a post-colony like South Africa, but should be taken into serious account in a variety of other contexts that still fail to take into account the coloniality of their current condition. And Sweden, my current home, is a case in point. In arguing for an engagement with coloniality, a southern perspective to apply linguistics resonates well with some of the powerful and cogent arguments advanced by scholars like Jonathan Rosa, Nelson Flores, Sami Alim, and others who are coalesced around the notion of racial linguistics. However, from a southern vantage point, I really hope, and this is just a note of caution, it's not a critique, that racial linguistics does not end up falling into the easy trap of universalizing US-specific discourses and practices. In saying so, something, sorry, quote, um, saying so, um, I want to recast and repurpose the concerns voiced by the Brazilian sociologist, sociologist Richard Miscolsi about US based queer of color critique. And Miscolsi says, Queer of color critique has played an important and positive role in the renewal and expansion of queer theory, but they also assert that it's more local and US centric than it recognizes. The world inside it is still centered in the US academic perspective, whose interests, networks, and theoretical models it pursues. There's nothing wrong with that, 
What is problematic is that this local frame, its implications for the ecology of knowledge are not questioned. In a similar vein, I hope that racial linguistics and southern perspectives on coloniality can forge key alliances in the struggle against the circulation and reproduction of settler colonial white hegemony. And these alliances do not necessarily need to be with white bodies like mine, but most importantly with black bodies in the South. Third, to theorize specifically on what the three black female students did. Applied linguistics should not fear performing undisciplined acts of nakedness, laying bare our skin, making visible those complex inscriptions of privilege and oppression that we carry as a result of colonial history. And related to this, like the students did um, at VETS, we should also take the risk of making ourselves illegible in our nakedness. As James Scott puts it, since legibility is a condition of manipulation, illegibility remains a reliable source for political autonomy. Viewed from the South, instead of trying to solve practical problems of language and communication, or even correct language mistakes, as a closed Facebook group that recently complained about the English usage of our conference organizer presumed to, we should consider that this is precisely in the problem and the mistake that the potential for political insubordination lies. Obrigado.